Hello and welcome to another episode of the Brad Davidson Show. Uh, excited to be here with you today. All week I've been preparing this show to focus on what I thought was kind of the foundation of where this all starts. And it was going to be all about how to maintain muscle mass outside of the gym. Lifestyle factors, nutrition factors. I really believe muscle mass is the fountain of youth. And I was on my way over here to meet with Caesar, my producer. He's awesome, by the way. And uh, I had this thought come over me. And it was like, you're lying. You're hiding. You know that's not the true foundation. You know that's not the deepest level where people need to start. You know it's mental and emotional scenarios. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm ready to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. But I have to. And it's the one part of this industry that no one wants to talk about or engage in. <laughs> I'm not going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't want to do it. It's uncomfortable. It's um, raw. But authentically, I have to share it with you. Is that if you're truly serious about great health, uh, great energy, a great life, all these things, physically taking care of yourself is only going to get you so far. If you do not engage in mental and emotional warfare on the health of that side of things for yourself, you'll never get to where you want to get to. Uh, a few years back, life took me out. And I really believe all of us are going to get taken out at some point. A lot of you probably already have. Um, and it absolutely destroyed me. And the scenario is just, it was my scenario, my way of being wiped out. Literally, life was pulled out from under me by decisions I didn't even make, just the, the way of the world at that point. And it destroyed me. And, and I, I didn't know how to deal with it. You see, I'd spent my whole life just telling myself if I was just physically could outwork anything, I could handle anything. And I would push myself to the extremes physically. And I really bought into that. Like That's where toughness came from, was the ability to handle hard workouts and to never give up and to always go. And then one day I woke up and my life was different. It, it was gone. Life that I knew was gone. And I didn't know how to deal with it. And, and I struggled with it. And at that point in my life, I saw my dad, who's always been my rock, and and then he, months later, passes away. And, and, and I had no idea what the hell to do. Uh, everything that I believed in, everything that I fought for, everything that I put my name on was gone. And he was gone. And I remember getting to the point where I just was ready to give up. I remember lying in bed thinking, I'm more valuable to my children dead than I am alive. I don't even know how I'm going to take care of them anymore. It, it was that bad. And started contemplating it. And I know a lot of you have been there. And uh, the first kind of step out of it came to me. And it came from my dad. And one of the biggest lessons my dad taught us growing up was that giving up is not an option. You just can't. That is the one thing that growing up, he would never allow us to do. If we made a commitment to something, we could not give up. And I thought about my children at that point, And you know, they didn't ask to be here. I brought them here. And I had the thought of, okay, I cannot give up on them. And so that was kind of my stepping stone. That was the place where I began to rebuild my life off of, was simply that. I cannot give up on my children. My children don't need the money that I have for them if I were to pass away. They need my presence. They need my guidance. They need my coaching. They just need my love and support. And I knew that because I had that growing up from my parents. I, it was never about money with them. It was always about experience, presence. They're always there for us. And, and so I knew that that was the most valuable thing and I had to be there for them. So that's where I started. It was simply that. Uh, just get out of bed every day and do something and just don't give up. That was the, the non-negotiable at that point. Just don't give up. So if you're there and you're contemplating those scenarios, um, I'm going to beg of you with all my heart, just don't give up. Find something to, to set your feet in, something that says, okay, this is more important than me. I have to be here for this. I have to get out of bed for this. There's something, okay? And, and there's always something. If there wasn't something, you wouldn't still be here. So you have a reason and a rhyme and a purpose to be here, I believe. So find that something. That was my something. And as I was going through it, I started noticing a lot of things that I would do. I was a hurt person at that point. I had been hurt. And I won't lie to you, I'm ashamed to say it, but I started hurting people. 
I became a raw shell of myself. I was just surviving. I was there for my kids. I wasn't really doing well, and I didn't know how to deal with it. So my habits became really, really poor. I, I would you know, drink more than normal. Uh, I was exercising all the time because that was the thing that would slow my mind down. I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Like All these horrible things were going on that I didn't know how to deal with. And so that's it. I, I would have some alcohol at night tonight trying to numb my brain so I could fall asleep for a couple hours. I'd wake up at 4 a.m. every morning in a panic like my life was falling apart. Then I go to the gym and work out to try to settle down that point. And then I would try to distract myself throughout the day. And then I go back for another workout later in the day. And I remember at one point, I had my kids with me in my apartment complex where I was living. And this young man came up to me and he's like, wow, man, no dad bod there. He's like, what do you do? And I said, well, it's really simple. And I just laid it out for him. I said, lose everything. I said, the stress of that will get you jacked faster than anything. And he's like, whoa. It was the truth at that point. I was under so much stress and I was just in this catabolic breakdown state that I was just losing everything. And what was left was the little bit of muscle mass I still had left because I was lifting weights, but I was, I was super lean. I looked great, but I was a walking train wreck. And I remember hearing this quote saying, hurt people hurt people. And I immediately recognized that I was doing that. I was a shell of myself. I didn't care about anything anymore. I was making poor decisions constantly and I was just hurting people left and right. My presence, my joy, all of that stuff was gone, and I, I was a horrible shell of my person. But the scenario that I was in at that point was absolutely killing me as a human being. Yeah, we tell you, just simply go work out, just simply eat healthy. It's all going to help fix that, and it's just not. You have to go deal with it. And, and I love one of my closest friends, Sam Baker, pulled me aside one day, and he's like, I can't take seeing you like this anymore. And he hands me a, a ticket and flies me off to Nashville to something called Onsite. And I'm going to be honest with you, what Onsite is, is it's like an adult therapy camp. It was seven days, or 10 months of therapy in seven days. It was super intense. And it just shattered my life and put me in a place where I got to see what I was doing, how I was being, and who I was. And it gave me the opportunity to start to rebuild my life. And so I did that. Started to rebuild day by day, piece by piece as I was going. But I'll be honest with you, it didn't fix everything. I still didn't want to deal with some of the deep trauma, some of the deep pain that I had inside of me, the misbeliefs I had about myself that I really believe a lot of us have. I just wanted to ignore it, hide from it, push it aside. You see, I spent my whole life building this life, hiding that part of it. And no matter how successful I got, it never went away. But now all of a sudden it was just rearing its ugly head and it was there. I couldn't, I couldn't not deal with it. But I tried. I tried to not deal with it. I kept my, my habits intact of drinking at night, uh, exercising a lot, just to try to keep that thing at bay. See, I always tried to hide behind how I looked. If I could just look good enough, people would still listen to me. They still trust me. They still want to work with me. But inside, I was dying still. I was going through a lot of therapy at that point, uh, really trying to work through this stuff. And therapy's scary. Yeah, I, I, I kind of grew up in an age where if you had to go to therapy, you were weak. And choosing to go through this, and, and you know, my buddy Sam is, if you don't know him, he's a huge man, played left tackle, one of the toughest dudes I've ever met in my life. And at that point, I'm like, whoa, if this guy's good with it, and this guy's telling me I need to go, I, I, I trust him, I love him, I, I look up to him, so I'm going to go. And, and, and in my opinion, that was the strongest thing I ever did for myself and for my children. And as I'm, I'm rebuilding and still not want to deal with things. See, life is a funny way of throwing it in your face until you're willing to deal with it. So I would rebuild and get to a place where I thought, oh, I'm all better now. My life's better. And then boom, something else would happen and throw it right back in my face. Life would not let me off the hook. And that's one of the things that a lot of us aren't realizing is that life has given us opportunity to grow, to, to recover, to heal from what's happened to us. And we're choosing to ignore it, to push it aside because we're scared. And I was, I was scared. But life just kept throwing it at me. It kept, I would start to rebuild and boom, it would take it all away again and just leave it right there for me. And I still didn't want to deal with it. This was years of a process. Okay, I don't, I don't want to hide this reality that you just go face it and boom, it's going to go away and all of a sudden life's great. No, this is, this is a long process. But to me, it's the most valuable process. If you truly want to be ha healthy, happy, high-performing, have the opportunity to live the longest po possible life the way you want, you got to get down to the nitty-gritty and deal with this stuff. 
I was having a conversation with my son um, a while back, and it was before one of his football games. And he was scared. And what kept coming out of him was, Dad, I'm not good enough to be here. And he's a great football player. I see him as how great he is, but this internal dialect is telling him he's not good enough to be there. And I asked him, who told you that? He goes, I don't know. I said, was it one of your coaches? No. Was it me? No. Was it your mom? No. Who told you that? He goes, well, no one told me that. I said, then why do you believe it? Well, I don't know. I'm just not. And I was like, man, my poor son is already struggling with the same things I'm struggling with. And I'm looking at him, seeing me, not realizing what to do. And then it caught me. I was part of this men's group and this guest speaker came on. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he laid it out this way. Your trauma is either transformed or it's transmitted. Either you have the strength to deal with your trauma. And let's face it, we all have trauma. I used to try to judge minds against others. Oh, what I have been there is not as bad as that person's. No, trauma is trauma. And it's impacting your health. It's impacting your life. It's impacting your presence. And it's impacting the people you love the most. And if you're like me and a lot, a, lot, a lot of people I've dealt with, you're hurting people because you're hurt. When he stated that, I'm like, oh my God, I am passing this off to my children. My son is just voicing to me all the same deep, dark, insecure issues I'm having, he's having. I have got to deal with this. And so from that day, that was the day I finally decided to suck it up and face it and start the journey. And, and here's where I started. I'll be super honest with you. I created a list of non-negotiables. I wanted three things I was going to stop doing from that point forward. And I was going to be three things that were damaging to me. Three things I was doing that were not healthy for me, that were not helping my life. They were simple. Number one, no more alcohol. And for the longest time, I told myself, I don't have a problem with alcohol. I'm never drunk. I haven't been drunk since I had my daughter 15 years ago. But I would still have one or two most nights to calm me down to take the stress away so I could fall asleep. I would still have one or two in environments to help me feel more comfortable so I would like fit in because I was insecure with myself. I said, so no more. I'm, I'm done drinking alcohol in, until I get to a point where I'm so comfortable and confident with who I am, all arenas of who I am, that I choose to have it because I enjoy it, not because I choose to have it to make me a different person or make me happier or more fun or any of those things I was using it for. Number two, I was gonna stop exercising so much. I preach this. Because I know how damaging overexercising is. But I, I needed it to numb me. I needed to beat the hell out of myself. And that's what I was using it for. I won't lie to you. I was punishing myself because I was so ashamed of who I was. I was ashamed of what happened to me. That shouldn't have happened to me, and it did. And so I was beating the hell out of myself with exercise, punishing myself. And I was numbing myself. And number three, this one sounds silly, but I stopped drinking soda. I know, here I am, a strength coach, a nutritionist, and I had a soda issue. You see, I could have sodas throughout the day to calm me down. It was the weirdest thing ever. But I would have two or three sodas a day. I couldn't eat. So I was getting all my caloric intake from soda. It was enough to keep me going throughout the day or it'd be an energy drink, and I cut those out as well. But I was using all this false sugar and energy to get me through my days because I was so worn out. So that's simply where I started. And by God, it started to work. And I kept going to therapy. I kept seeing my therapist. His name's Adam. He's wonderful. And I love him because he just calls me on my shit because I'm so good at trying to manipulate and work myself around and convince myself I'm fine. I have these cycles that I go through and he sees it and he calls me on it. But I'm months into this process now. And I can tell you right now that cutting out the alcohol was the greatest gift I ever gave myself. It sucked in the beginning. Now, I cut out alcohol. I cut out going to all the places where people were drinking. I just didn't want to be around it. It caused so much pain in my life that I didn't want to be around it anymore. I just wanted to completely cut it out and live a life where it wasn't present. And I've finally gotten to a point now where I can go anywhere, into any environment, and walk in and be so comfortable with myself, happy. I'm having just as much fun as everyone else is now. They're drinking, which I don't judge. I'm fine with it. But I no longer need it to change who I am. I no longer need it to feel comfortable in that environment because I'm so comfortable with myself. And just that right there, getting rid of those simple things, those, those non-negotiables that I'm no longer dealing with or hurting me has dramatically improved my health. And my brain has changed after going months and months without alcohol. 
It's amazing how much calmer I am and anxiety in life is gone. The fears of life are gone. All that has subsided and, and, and really reduced myself a lot. And then I had my next big breakthrough not long ago uh, with Adam. He shared with me what he calls the board of directors. And each one of us have a board of directors. And there's four people in this board of directors. There's the lover. And that is the person inside of you, the thing inside of you that, that wants the best for you, that loves who you are. It's that inner voice trying to guide you the right directions. That's the part of you that loves yourself. And there's the friend. The friend is the things that are good for you, that help you attach and get closer to the lover. And then there's what's called the individualist. This is the person that you are and it sways, okay? So if you're doing things that are good for you, you're swaying yourself more towards the friend and the lover. But then there's also the fear monger. This is that voice in your head. Oh man, things are too good right now. Life's about to fall apart. Oh, if you go talk to that person, what if, what if, what if they reject you? Oh, don't get into business. What if you start that business and it bombs? Oh, your children are suffering. You know, what if you step in and try to be a great parent and it doesn't work out? It's always fear mongering, telling you life's about to get worse. And then there's the ugliness called your habit, the habit monsters. This is the things we begin to use because the fear monger is freaking us out. We begin to use the habits to numb, to distract. That's the things like alcohol, right? I don't know what it is for you, but there's all these different tools we can use. That was the one I would use for myself to numb and to change me. That and exercise are my two big ones. And what happens with the individualist, that fear monger is constantly trying to pull the individualist to the habits. It's trying to freak you out, trying to get you back to the habits that are harming you and wrecking you because that's safe and comfortable. We've lived in that environment. We know that environment. It's safe to us. To get away from all those habits is scary as hell because it's the unknown. We don't actually know how to deal with it very well. It was so hard the first few weeks of not drinking, of slowing down my exercise, of having to just sit in my emotion and feel it and journal about it and not run from it. It was scary as hell and hard. I'm not going to lie to you. But what Adam taught me in this scenario is that we have control of our board of directors. When you start to do things that feed the friend, example, go for a walk, choosing not to drink alcohol that day, right? Meditating, journaling, eating a healthy meal, all these things that we can do for the friend begin to pull us closer to the lover. We begin to believe more and more in ourselves and who we are. We believe to see our true light. It's so funny because now that I'm in the midst of it, what I've come to really realize is that so often that thing that we're so ashamed of, that we're trying to hide from the world, we're fighting like hell to keep it from the world is often our greatest gift to give to the world. You see, for me, it's my tender heart. And that's hard for me to share with you because I feel like that's a weak thing. I grew up in the world of sports, right? And it's like, be a man, suck it up, go hard, don't show weakness. And I spent my whole life thinking that's how I had to be. But I would recognize that when I was really connecting with my clients, my professional athletes, the people I'm working on a day-to-day basis, my children, it's when I'd show up with a tender heart. Like, I'm there, I care about you. Yeah, I'm gonna push you, but I love you. I can't tell you how many of my professional athletes tell me that they love me. And that's pretty awesome to me. The more I've settled into that and accept that and realize that when I show up with my tender heart and I push people, but I love on them, I get much more from them and, and I get these relationships that are incredibly strong and the relationship with my children that started showing up with a tender heart versus trying to tell them the right thing to do, but actually being there for them instead of disciplining them, talking to them, helping them find the right choices in a loving way. My relationship with them has just flourished. And here's the funny part. I spent my whole life trying to look a certain way, thinking if I just looked a certain way, my life would be great. People would respect me. I'd, I'd have more attention. People would want to work with me more. And I sacrificed and suffered for decades trying to look a certain way. And what's funny now is that I, I suffer less. I sacrifice less. I still work out hard, but I'm doing it out of love to myself versus punishing myself. And I'm living more and more in my true state with this tender heart. And I'm facing my demons. I'm looking at the ugliness and I'm forgiving myself for that ugliness. And I'm creating restitution for the damage that I've done in the past. And all of this is freeing me. And my health is getting drastically better day by day. I can lay my head down at night instead of being ashamed and embarrassed about what I'm doing to try to survive. I'm actually proud of who I am day to day. So I'm sleeping better. 
And my God, my body looks better than it ever has in my life. I'm about to be 48. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Over the last five months, I lost 30 pounds and then put it all back on going through this cycle. It was hellaciously hard. It was the scariest thing I've ever done. And I'm still in the middle of it. I'm smart enough to know that I'll never be an end to this. I'll always be battling this and I'll always be up against this. And I'm always at risk of that fear monger and the habits to take back control. But at least I know it's there and I'm fighting it. And I'm having the courage to fight it. And I just want to leave you with this. At the foundation of great health, at the foundation of looking good, of being your most present state, of showing up your best with the people you love and in this world, you got to face the demons. And I wish there was another way around this. I wish there was an easier way. I wish I could have just come in here and sat down and talked about how to manage muscle mass. <laughs> We're going to talk about that next week because I do. it's very important. It is the fountain of youth. But if you don't deal with the ugliness inside, the pain inside, the trauma inside that others have caused to you, that maybe you've caused yourself, there's a, probably a mixture of a lot of it. You'll never fully reach that pinnacle of great health, of looking great, of feeling great about yourself. And, oh, here's the other funny thing. The more I've dealt with these demons, the less I care about how I look. How funny is that? I look the best I've ever looked, but I care the least ever about it. It, it no longer defines me. I, I do it because I love myself. I, I don't do it because I'm trying to earn other people's love. It's now a gift to me versus trying to create a gift for others to want to be around me. No one cares about that. In all honesty, no one cares about how you look. They care about how you make them feel. But you can only give to them what you can give to yourself. So that's my first challenge to everyone. If you're truly serious about great health, if you're truly serious about becoming the best version of yourself possible, face your demons. <laughs>